military weapon becomes tomorrow's peacetime instrument. Plastics will play as large a role in peace as they do in war. Here is a plane containing hundreds of plastic parts. Here, another bonded by plastics. This paratrooper floating down to welcome Mother Earth is depending on plastics to get him there safely. His parachute is made of nylon, a plastic. As for plastics in peace, here they are in our homes, augmenting our comforts, serving our needs. And when we take to the open road, we find them again in our car. Plastic, plastic, plastic. What are plastics? Are they vegetable or mineral? Would you look for them on land or under it? Perhaps they are in the sea. Are they extracted from the air as nitrogen was at Muscle Shoals, now part of the TVA? Or does the sun produce them as it does chlorophyll in plants? Are they a gift of nature? Or an invention of man? And if they are man-made, why bother making them at all unless they improve on nature's handiwork or add to her gifts? The old adage has it that necessity is the mother of invention. Nowhere is this truer than in the field of plastics. For a better understanding of how this modern industry originated, let us turn back the pages of history to 1869 when Grant was meant. Ivory, a natural product of elephant tusks, was used at that time to make billiard balls and piano keys. But it was growing too costly. The growing demand, the slaughter of whole herds of elephants in the long haul from the Congo to the States, all these made it necessary to find an available substitute. Now was the time to come to the aid of the grand old pachyderm. By treating cotton letters with nitric acid, just as this chemist is doing, and then adding camphor, John Wesley Hyatt found that the resulting mixture, a gooey semi-liquid substance called a resin, could be molded into permanent shape by heat and pressure. Because it was made from the cellulose in cotton, Hyatt called the new substance celluloid. Originally a cheap, plentiful, and man-made substitute for ivory, celluloid, one of the earliest of plastics, made its way into the manufacture of novelties such as combs, toys, billiard balls, slide rules, and frames for glasses. But it had one serious defect. It could burn. It was not until 1907, another Roosevelt was then in the White House, that a non-inflammable plastic was invented by Dr. Leo Bakelin, to which he gave the name Bakelite. Using essentially the same process, but employing different materials, Dr. Bakeland put together two compounds of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. One, a preserving fluid called formaldehyde. The other, phenol, commonly called carbolic acid. of this putting together, or synthesis, is then heated. 
The waste products are driven off, and the result is a resin which can be molded by heat and pressure to any shape. After it becomes a powdered resin, fillers are added, which alter the properties of the basic compound. of asbestos may make it heat resistant. Just the thing for such purposes as insulating, electric iron handles, fire helmets, and trays. Your modern telephone, for example, is a phenolic plastic material and therefore will not burn readily. Perhaps the chemist desires an impact resistant resin to be used in industry where tough, durable materials are required. Something new, cotton filler, is added. Thus, plastics, which at first were a novelty material, began to take a small but vital part in industry. Plastics are no longer a substitute. For certain purposes, they're better. Now, the dictionary tells us that a plastic is any substance which is capable of being molded. But to the chemist, for his modern plastics, it is actually more complicated. Essentially, he's a molecular engineer. He takes organic substances, those containing carbon, such as petroleum, cotton, wood, milk, or another source material of plastics, coal which was, if you recall, once vegetable matter. He takes one molecule made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, puts it together with another molecule containing the same elements, but in different arrangement, and the reaction results in a new molecule, which looks like this. Now, this single molecule, or monomer, is like one man with a baseball. He can't play a game. Nine men don't have much steam, but put them together and you have a team. So it is with isolated monomers. They're not much use alone either. Disconnected monomers are not too hip. Make them a polymer, it has more pep. Just as our nine men fused into a new entity, a team, so our individual monomers, by banding together, formed a new entity, a polymerized resin, with the chemist acting as coach. But his job isn't quite finished. The resin must undergo training. Does the chemist want a flexible resin? He adds a plasticizer. For other qualities, fillers. Now, once our plastic is ready to be processed, it may be treated in many ways. It may be molded. be laminated. Finished, it is either a thermoplastic such as lucite, which can be remelted like ice, or a thermosetting material such as phenolformaldehyde, which cannot be remelted but sets like a hard boiled egg. 
It wasn't until the late 1930s, however, that plastics came into their own. The little corporal beyond the Rhine marshaled his people for war. Germany, well aware of difficulties in obtaining raw materials, ordered her scientists to develop substitutes, ersatz materials. There were ersatz boots, ersatz clothes, ersatz oil. Germany was to become self-sufficient. Plastics played an essential role. When Hitler felt prepared, he attacked. Came the fall of Poland, the sweep over France, the Battle of Britain, and the march on Moscow. England, desperate for the weapons of war, turned to us for help. Lend-lease was the answer. Conscription, unheard of in our country in time of peace, was ordered by Congress in the interests of national defense. A peaceful America, shaken from its lethargy by Pearl Harbor, took off its coat, rolled up its sleeves, and went to work. But war is a greedy monster, devouring huge mountains of raw materials, enormous stockpiles of rubber, silk, oil, and gas. Soldiers must be fed, clothed, housed, and equipped. But how? Japan had taken the Dutch East Indies. Indochina also was theirs. Singapore and Hong Kong had fallen. All the wealth of the Indies was in enemy hands. Its rubber, its tin, its great stores of oil. Silk, a predominantly Japanese product, was beyond our reach. But tanks need treads, planes need fuel, and flyers need chutes. Who was to supply them? What was to replace them? Plentiful metals replaced scarce ones. South American possibilities were explored. The research chemist in private and government laboratories redoubled his study of our most promising man-made replacement, plastics. From a modest yearly production of some 25 million pounds in 1927, the industry swelled to a total of 650 million by 1943, a gargantuan increase of 2,600 percent, which exceeded that of any other comparable industry. And 85 percent of its production was devoted to war whether it was in the form of a bonding agent in the plywood construction of planes and PT boats, as a protective coating such as paints or varnishes based on vinyl plastics, the diversified uses of nylon, cellophane, methyl methacrylate, or polystyrene. 17 of every 20 pounds of plastics went off to the wars. What can be made with plastics? Things as varied as buttons and batons. Cosmetic containers and cockpit housings, parachutes and refrigerators, radios and razors, all contain plastics. As the need for raw materials develops, the farmer may find new industrial markets for former waste products, such as corn cobs, oat hulls, nut shells, cotton waste, and the casein in his sour milk. Perhaps the future holds plastic possibilities for China's soybeans. And for ours, too, since the American production of soybeans is already half that of China. The industry has a need for chemists to explore the molecular world, engineers and mechanics to plan, execute, and perform the various processings, and designers to add grace and beauty to the utility of the finished product. Today, plastics are changing the appearance of our everyday world. As the years go by, new materials will be found, new processes discovered, and new machinery invented. Not by those now engaged in industry, but by you. With new uses, there arise new wants. New wants mean new markets, new prosperity. This world of the molecule belongs to us all. It is yours to explore your new frontier.